On the behalf of the Cornerstone Church for Christ, we welcome all of you to our meeting tonight. Uh, when we meet together during the time of discussion, the uh, all of you folks that are here are our honored and invited guests. I want you to know that we're glad to see you. Some have been not been here before, and others this is a repeat. But we're glad to see you just as well. So welcome to this evening's event of Bible study. This evening will be divided into four parts, four sessions of 30 minutes each, with a intermission after the second speech of a few minutes to give you a bathroom break, and then we'll get right back into the second uh, session of discussions. There are only two men here tonight that will be speaking, designated uh, to be speakers during this debate. And they, of course, are Ron Halbrook, who is evangelist with the Hebron Lane Church of Christ in Shepherdsville, Kentucky, no stranger to here or eastern Kentucky and many other places. We're glad to have him here in this discussion. And also from the London Christian Church, uh, Derek Baker is here Amen. and preaches for the Christian Church out near the lake uh, on the London Road. What's the name of that church, Derek? I mean, the name of that road? 192. Okay. We know where it's at, but I didn't remember the name. Uh, we The question of the subject I've discussed this evening is, does the New Testament authorize singing and worship to the exclusion of instrumental music. Tonight, this will be affirmed by Ron Halbrook, and of course, will be denied uh, by a brother Baker. Friday evening, the decision will be, I mean, the, the meeting will be reversed, if I understand that correctly. But the same subject is up for debate tomorrow night as well. It will be affirmed and by the Christian church and denied by the Church of Christ. And so it should be an interesting study. We would ask you once again to refrain from interfering with anything that goes on from the speaker stand uh, so that we would not interrupt the train thought of those who are doing the speaking. At this time, my colleague here wants to uh, do the same thing I'm doing, and so we're going to give him that opportunity. Eugene Abel uh, will be giving his uh, instruction information as well. Brother Eugene. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone, that uh, felt the need to come out and the importance to come out Anytime we gather together in the name of the Lord to study, it's high-level quality Christian stuff. And we welcome everybody. First of all, need to put a disclaimer out there in the local paper and maybe some other places. It was advertised that this was a Crooked Creek Christian Church versus Cornerstone Church of Christ. That is not the case. The elders, the leadership at Crooked Creek Christian Church, along with the evangelists, do in no way support this meeting tonight. So in other words, Crooked Creek Christian Church has no dog in this fight. Just let's get that clear. This is brothers that have come together who have accepted Bob, his request to study this subject, and we happily accept it. And I would introduce them. Would you want me to introduce them at this time? Sure. We have Leonard Stone, brother in Christ. Another brother in Christ, John McCord. And of course, has done been introduced, Derek Baker, the evangelist at Laurel Chapel Christian Church in London. So once again, I'll reiterate what Bob has said. No amen and no praise the Lord, no sicking bulldog, none of that stuff. Everyone remain silent and study. Meditate upon what's being spoken, and let's feed and learn. Thank you, Eugene. 
Before we pause for a word of prayer, we want to make mention also, after the debate this evening, there will be a 20-minute period of time in which we will give you, the audience, an opportunity uh, to ask a question, but it must be given in written form so as not to cause any misunderstanding. And so you can give this in written form to either group, if that's my understanding. And so that we're going to do that and give you an opportunity to ask questions concerning the subject matter. If there's nothing else uh, at this time, we ask that may God Almighty bless this meeting, that we may honor the Lord with our gathering. Amen. Let's offer a word of prayer in behalf of this meeting at this time. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that has been presented to us to represent thee here tonight to discuss what we believe that the Bible teaches and that we want to only study to know the truth, not to champion a person or cause, but to champion the cause of Jesus Christ in this world. We understand there's so much religious confusion here at home and abroad, and so we need more meetings like this, and may they happen. May we be a catalyst that will maybe get this started again as it was in days of yesteryear. We ask you to bless both speakers of the sound mind this night, given and that they may present their material in a way that all of us will hear it and understand it, then we'll be able to compare it. Thank you again for all that are here. As now we get started, bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Halbrook, the floor is yours. We're here tonight by the loving providence of God who opened a door for us to have this opportunity to come together and study from the Holy Scriptures. I want to thank each one who is in attendance, but especially to thank Brother Derek for his willingness to come and participate in a study of this kind. And I know that it can be profitable as we discuss issues dividing brethren, in particular instrumental music proposition for tonight's discussion is this. The New Testament authorizes singing and worship to the exclusion of, the, of instrumental music. When I say the New Testament, uh, yes, the New Testament, I'm referring, of course, to the 27 New Testament books in the Bible. When we say authorizes, we simply mean the Bible teaches or instructs us in this matter. And then, when we speak about Singing in worship, we mean singing as an act of worship to God to the exclusion of instrumental music. No other form of music is authorized other than singing. What is not authorized then is excluded. So I hope that will simply give you a clear idea of the proposition that we will discuss. In Mark 16 and 16, we know that Jesus proclaimed, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So I understand that Brother Derek and others from the Christian church have obeyed this teaching and the Lord forgives our sins when we do. He adds us to the universal church. In James 5, 19 and 20, a brother may err from the truth. Love helps him to find the truth. And that's the motive of our being here tonight. Revelation 22:18 teaches us not to add anything to God's word and then verse 19, not to take anything away from God's word. 
But in this case, we can see that we teach contradictory doctrines. When what we teach contradicts, we cannot both be right. Correction is needed. If I'm the one that needs to be corrected to find the truth, I will thank Derek with all of my heart. If I can help him to be directed to find the truth, I think he would have the same disposition. We're not here to win a boxing match. We're here in the interest of truth and helping each other go to heaven. Then debate is helpful if properly conducted. I know that many people complain and give debating a bad name, so let me briefly say this. Jesus is not only the master teacher, he is the master debater. It is not a disgrace to do what Jesus did. You can read in Matthew 22, 23 to 33, just one example of Jesus participating in debate. Now, some have said, yes, yes, but brethren should never debate. Well, open your Bible, you can read in Acts 15, the apostles debated with believers, with brethren. Truth was at stake, and it is appropriate to do this if done in a proper way. In Acts 15, 28, Apollos vigorously debated in defense of the truth. So if Derek seems to be vigorous tonight, don't criticize him for that. He's just following the example of Apollos. Each speaker agrees to speak and act in a courteous manner befitting to a Christian, addressing the issues at hand and avoiding personal derogatory remarks. So we're simply following the example of the New Testament by participating in a discussion of this, time, this kind. Psalm 133, verse 1, of course, very beautiful passage. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity is a blessing. Division is always a tragedy. Unity can be found in the New Testament pattern of teaching on any subject. In this case, I want to show that God revealed the pattern of worship. It includes singing. Division has come when man added instrumental music in worship. I think some of you are aware the restoration movement swept through Kentucky back in the 1800s, just like there's a great harvest now in the Philippines and other parts of the world. And no instruments were used among our brethren until L. L. Pinkerton at Midway, Kentucky introduced one in 1859. There were very few churches that were interested in going down that road because they had staked out the ground that we do exactly what the Bible says. But between 1975 and 1925, there came a period when the instrument spread more and more and there was a separation of Christian churches from churches of Christ. And the original melodeon is displayed at Midway University in Midway, Kentucky, but I wish that event had never happened and that we had continued united through these years. As you well know, Jesus in John 17, 17 to 21, prayed for us. He prayed, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Then he prayed for the disciples at hand, but he said, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That would be you and me that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe thou hast sent me. Christ unites us in the truth. Let's search for that truth. I want to begin by addressing the root problem. The instrument is not the root problem. But how we understand Bible authority is the root. We must respect the limits of Bible authority. I think this audience will agree with that premise. We are not to go beyond what is written, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Do not think of men above that which is written, Paul said. We need to stay with what we can point to that is written. We are to speak as the oracles of God in 1 Peter 4, 11, that God in all things may be glorified. Then in Revelation 22, 8, 10, and 19, the Bible closes with a warning that we do not add to this word or subtract from it. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. And so we need to be so careful and so cautious to abide within the limits 
of Bible authority. Now, the Bible, of course, is written in words because God gave the gift of language at the beginning of time. From the first day Adam and Eve could communicate through words, God gave that gift. At the Tower of Babel, God again bestowed languages on the human family. And so my point is that God designed language. It works by his pattern or design. Bible authority is expressed in three words. This is how words communicate. Direct statement or command, as in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. This is not some theological construct when we say the Bible teaches by direct statement or command. It's the same way we communicate every day. I might say to my son, your room looks like a pigsty. Clean your room. Well, I don't stop to say that's a direct command. But in the instinctive way that language communicates, we know that's the case. In Acts 20, verse 7, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them. Here is an approved example that the New Testament church met and ate the Lord's Supper every Sunday. But again, approved example is inherent in the communication process of language. I might say to my child, here is how to tie your shoestrings. Do it the way daddy does it. My example communicates. The Bible does that. And then necessary implication in Matthew 3.16 when Jesus was baptized, he went straight up, straight way out of the water. Now the Bible does not directly say he went down into the water, but did he go down into the water? The Bible implies that he did. You can't come up out of the water if you don't go down into the water. This is how language functions. The mother says dinner is ready, and we all instinctively know what that implies. It means it's time to eat. So I'm simply saying the Bible communicates with us the same way we do in everyday language. Now silence is the absence of authority and it prohibits, it does not give permission. Silence means no command, no example, no implication. When I cannot put my finger on the book, chapter, and verse that instructs me to do something, then I should not be doing that. Remember Hebrews 7:14. It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. When God said the Levites would be the priest, he did not have to say, not Judah. Because the way language works, by having not mentioned Judah, Judah that silence automatically excluded Judah. And not even Christ would violate that principle. So silence is not permission, it is a prohibition. We stop where God's word stops. And the same in 1 Peter 4.11, again, speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where it is silent. So we stop because silence forbids. We stop where the Bible stops. You, some of you know the name Thomas Campbell, one of the older preachers. He was, a Meth he was a Presbyterian preacher. He was practicing baby baptism at the time this happened in 1808. But he was studying with people just like us and working his way out of those eras. And he said, we're going to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where it is silent. Well, one of the people in the study said, well, if we do that, uh, it will be an end to infant baptism. And I love the honesty and the humility of the answer Thomas Campbell gave. Now remember, he was still practicing infant baptism. He said, if infant baptism is not found in the scripture, we can have nothing to do with it. Now that's honesty. But this principle explains why he did not worship with instrumental music. It's the same principle. In 1809, he wrote a little paper called Declaration and Address to just summarize what he had been learning and he said, the Church of Christ will resume its original unity, peace, and purity if we adopt the practice of the primitive church expressly exhibited in the New Testament. I believe that principle was true. And I believe it is still true tonight. Now, language uses both general terms and specific terms. And again, this is not some special theology. I'm just talking about how language communicates. 
General terms include all things in a class of things. So if I go in a grocery store and I said to the employee, I'm looking for food, well, he can give me any kind because I used a general comprehensive term. But the specific terms are different. They identify one thing in a class of things, excluding all other things in the same class. So if I said, I want rice, think of the hundreds of things in that store I've automatically excluded because I used one specific term. That's how language functions. I would also like to clarify that commands include aids and exclude additions. And again, this is not some special theology that I'm trying to put over on you. This is just how language works. Aids facilitate fulfilling a command. And they don't have to always be mentioned. Using general terms or expressing general authority includes all means and methods and aids and expediencies. When I said clean your room, that could mean get a garbage can and get a broom and get a rag. But I don't have to say all that. Those aids automatically go with the command in the nature of language. Additions go beyond what is authorized. Additions add something to what is specified in a class of things. So if I said, give me rice, please, and they brought me rice and donuts and fish, that's an addition. Specific authority designates one thing in a class of things and thus automatically excludes all other things in the same class of things. That's just how language works. So to quickly illustrate that, you're familiar with the story of Noah and the ark in Genesis 6. In a generic command, build an ark. But the Lord gave some specifics. Go for wood. Now, aids were automatically included, and they're not even mentioned because they need not be mentioned. If you build an ark, you have to get tools. That's an aid. But an addition would be oak wood, pine wood, coconut wood, or any other wood. The specific term gopher wood automatically excluded the others, but it's not necessary to say not oak, not pine, not coconut. You'd be there all day saying that. Another generic would be the command of baptism, which is throughout the New Testament, such as Mark 16, 16. But the New Testament makes this very specific as immersion. An aid would be a baptistry, that need not be mentioned, or a pool, it need not be mentioned, or a river, it need not be specified. Those things go automatically with the baptism because you have to have something that holds the water. But an addition would be sprinkling or pouring. And I think we all would recognize that. This is how language works. In 1 Corinthians 11 and other passages, we have the generic command to observe the Lord's Supper. But there are some specifics, such as the first day of the week, the elements, the fruit of the vine and the unleavened bread, and the meaning is specified. It is to remember the death of Christ. Now, there are aids. There are expediencies. What time of day? What kind of containers? Where will we gather? Those things have to be decided upon, but those things need not be specified. They're inherent in the command. If you're going to meet for the Lord's Supper, you have to choose a time of day. But additions would be a Saturday Lord's Supper, a ham and coke Lord's Supper, or what even some of our preachers are recently proposing, a full meal for the Lord's Supper. Now, the Bible doesn't say don't have a full meal, but doesn't have to. When it specified the elements, that automatically eliminated everything else. And so that brings me to the point tonight. Many times this general command is found that we should make melody unto the Lord, but it is given in a specific sing. Aids, such as books and lights, are not mentioned. They need not be mentioned because they're inherent in the command. But additions would mean playing instruments of music because that's another kind of music. One kind was specified that automatically would exclude others. Now, the New Testament pattern reveals singing in worship. I've simply tried to give you a background to understand why I 
make these next points. Music is a general term. Within that classification, singing, vocal music, playing, instrumental music, and those would be specific terms within that larger classification. If the New Testament says make music in worship, the general term authorizes both sing and play. This general term is not used of New Testament worship. Specifics, rather, are used. Christ authorizes singing, which is vocal music. Matthew 26, 30, they sung an hymn. In Acts 16, 25, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. You see the specific here. Romans 15, 9, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Don't forget to check my time, by the way. Then, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, sing with the spirit and the understanding. Sing is a specific term. Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Notice the word speaking. This is how this worship is, authored, uh, is offered. Singing, the speaking in the form of singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is congregational worship, simultaneous reciprocal action. Speaking to yourselves means when I'm speaking in the song, you're speaking in the song. We are offering it to the Lord, but also we are teaching and admonishing one another. Colossians 3.16 teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So again, specific. The music is vocal. And again, simultaneous reciprocal action is taught. In Hebrews 2.12, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. And then Hebrews 13, 15, we offer the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And so that would be vocal music. And then James 5, 13 is the last passage. Is any merry, let him sing psalms. And so there again, he specified vocal music. So notice we have nine occasions that the New Testament addresses worship in the form of music, and every time, what did it specify? Remember, music is a general category. There's more than one thing in that category. There is singing, and there is playing. And if the Lord just simply gave the general category, we're free to choose. But if the Lord specified singing, never mentioned the instrument, which is another kind of music, then we're not authorized to use the instrument. Just notice briefly how singing is authorized. Direct command in Ephesians 5.19, singing and making melody. Approved example in Acts 16.25, when Paul was singing in prison. Then necessary implication in Hebrews 13.15, the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of the lips. Oh, that would be singing too. So singing is authorized in the normal way that language communicates and gives authority. Now the Old Testament authorized instruments of music in worship. I want to touch on that to show you that God knows how to authorize instruments when he wants them. Think about that. He did not leave the Old Testament worshipers to decide they wanted to use instruments. They liked instruments. They, said, they would say, we have a talent, so we're going to worship with instruments. That is not how it happened. Here is how it happened. And there are many other passages. 2 Corinthians 29, 25, he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals. He names the instruments with psalteries and with harps, according to the commandment of David, of Gad the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. For so was the... For so was the, what's that next word? Commandment of the Lord by his prophets. That's how God lets us know instrumental music is authorized. 
There's no authority for instruments in the New Testament. There is simply no scripture, no book, no chapter, no verse. We cannot put our finger on that passage. There are no general or specific terms that would authorize the use of the instrument. There's no direct statement. There's no approved example. There is no necessary implication. Think about that. God designed language so that it functions in this way so that we can communicate clearly. And then God uses language to communicate to us. And this is exactly how language functions. Silence excludes and prohibits and forbids. So if I go in the grocery store and I ask for rice, there's no need to say, do not give me ham, do not give me milk, do not give me cheese. I would be there all day trying to finish my order. When I say give me rice, I'm dealing in a category of food, but I'm doing it by giving a specific reference. A specific reference. And so, I want you to think with me about this. The New Testament authorizes singing in worship. We have shown that verse after verse after verse. Direct command, approved example, and necessary implication. There is no question, and I think we will agree that far. But the point is to understand the way language functions, this excludes instrumental music. My appeal is to the 27 books of the New Testament. It authorizes by teaching us what God wants us to do. Singing is an act of worship to God, and no other form of music is authorized, and what is not authorized is excluded. So someone is erring. Either I'm erring or Derek is erring. And we want to reach out in love to correct one another when and if we are erring. We should not add anything. We should not take away anything. When what we teach contradicts, both cannot be right. Correction is needed tonight. And debating, remember, is proper. I want to touch that again as we close this first speech. I'm appealing for unity. I'm here in the interest of unity. I love you, even though some of you I'm just meeting for the first time, including Brother Derek. This division is tragic. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. But there is unity in the New Testament pattern. And our early brethren in Kentucky had that unity by following God's instruction to sing. Remember it is when men added the instrument that the division came. Christ unites us in the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thank you for your good attention. Give me just a moment to remove this so that Derek can set up his. for this? Yes.
I'd like to begin by expressing my thanks and appreciation uh, to each one in this room that'd like to be a part of this. I'm especially thankful to our hosts and uh, appreciate the courtesy that we've been shown and how you guys are conducting yourself. I really do appreciate that. I, I want you to know before we even begin, um, I am not your adversary. I'm not an enemy to you. And uh, I, I love you, and I, I really hope that we can come together um, around the hope. This, this, this entire thing for me is a plea to reunite in Christ for the sake of the world. And so that's my, that's my hope, that's my goal, and uh, that we would not see each other in an adversarial way, but we would see each other as friends and brethren. Tonight's proposition, it's a bad sign. Sorry, let me uh, restart this slideshow. Thank you for that. Thank you. Let me resume. Tonight's proposition is the New Testament authorizes singing and worship to the exclusion of instrumental music. Now, I want to address three points as to why that I find myself in the negative position of this statement. The three places that I would like to touch upon is, is actually addressed in the statement. The New Testament authorizes. I want to talk about authority. And uh, my, my colleague has already began to talk about that subject. And I, I would also like to talk about worship, as we also see that as a part of our proposition. And lastly, in this, uh, in this first half hour, uh, singing and the, the concept of singing, because again, um, authorizes singing to the exclusion of instrumental music. So this is where um, I would like to labor with you together. Um, all commandments, promises, and warnings that God has not repealed constitute the will of God for man today. Now, that, that is a principle and a subject that I'm going to be working backwards from. Um, my colleague has stated that he is working backwards from a position of command, example, and necessary inference. Um, I do totally agree that in the Bible we find commands, examples, and implications. Where we would disagree very likely is what constitutes the word necessary. And uh, in my mind, at least the way that I understand it, the word necessary would have to be unavoidable. And I think that is uh, within the statement that I have here, commands, promises, and warnings that God has not repealed constitute the will of God for man today. I have here 1 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I, I have uh, highlighted here the simple statement that I want to just run by your mind again. All scripture is inspired by God. So I will be finding my authority uh, from the author. From the author. Um, my colleague has already begun to talk about silence. What, what silence, or, I'm sorry, what authority does silence hold? I, I fully admit that anything that's in the scripture, whatever is written, has authority over us. Whatever God has said, I take question with what God has not said. Mm -hmm. All scriptures that have not been revealed are authorized and lawful. That's a statement I want to run by you. All scriptures that have not been repealed are authorized and lawful, coming from the author. Um, authority comes from what the author says. But I do not accept authority from what the author does not say because he is the one that gives the authority, being the author. 
But silence in and of itself, I find, to have no authority. No authority. Uh, Romans 7, 7 through 8. Paul, writing to the church, says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you should not covet. But sin, taking the opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So apart from the law, sin is dead. We wouldn't know what sin is if God had not revealed His will to us through His law so that we can know what's right and what's wrong. I'm very happy about that because I don't want to try to guess and figure out what, what God is pleased with and what He isn't. I'm just happy to, for Him to tell us. Sin is transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is transgression of the law. It's just nice to define terms. And, uh, and we need to understand, what is sin? How, how do we arrive at the idea of what is sinful? It's transgression of the law. I gave the King James uh, version as well. Uh, it's worded a bit differently, but I, but I prefer it actually. Transgression of the law. The NASB says sin is lawlessness. When the author gives his commands, promises, and warnings, and we trespass those, we're guilty. We're guilty. Yes, God says nothing. We are innocent. Sin is not imputed without transgression of the law. No law equals no sin. I'm making that statement. Now, that statement covers some ground, and it's pretty broad. I want you to think of the idea of the imputation of sin. The Bible teaches us that sin was in the world before law. Men were doing things that God did not approve of, did not like before he gave those laws for certain. But he did not impute to them sin until he specified those laws. I'd like to read you four examples that I have stated here to support uh, this statement where there's no law there is no violation. It's John 9, 41. This comes from Christ. Jesus said to them, speaking to the Pharisees um, that, that were stirring up a lot of trouble and they were uh, not liking some of his discipline towards them, he said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, we see, we understand, your sin remains. See, if they truly were blind, if he had not told them, if he had not informed them, they were truly in darkness, he would not have imputed any sin to them. But they said, we're not in darkness. We see and we understand. So he says the sin remains. John 15, 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, again, the words of Christ, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Why, why is it that now they have no excuse for their sin? It's because he did come and he told them. He spoke to them. And now they have no excuse. If he had not come, they maybe would have an argument to make. But, but, but he came, he spoke to them, they were rejecting him, and he said, now there's no excuse. Your sin. Romans 4.15 this is again Paul writing to the church at Rome. He says the law, it brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there also is no violation. Now, now my colleague says that, that silence prohibits, and if, if we transgress silence, we're guilty of sin. Silence has, not only do the words of Christ have authority over us, not only does the scripture have authority over us, but also Silence itself has authority over us. This is where we would disagree. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed. 
where there is no law. So I realize the heading, no law, no sin. Somebody might say, now wait a minute, wait a minute. I understand that Romans 5, 13 is there, but I want you to understand the, that it being imputed. We know from uh, Acts chapter 17, for example, that, that there, there were times where God winked at some ignorance. But he says now he's asking all men everywhere to repent. And Paul preached that to the, uh, in Athens. The author thoroughly establishes. What I mean by this statement is, is uh, God did not give us most of what we need and then leave it up to us to debate and decide which parts that we have to figure out for ourselves in order to ascertain his will. The author thoroughly establishes. Look at 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Seeing that his divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. I would point out again in verse 3, he has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Can you see in that statement all commands, promises, and warnings? Can you see in that statement how all of those find their way into just that simple verse? It speaks to all these commands, promises, and warnings. Any of those that have not been repealed, it's God's will towards us today. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that we don't have to interpret the silence of God? We don't have to try to understand and fill in the blanks. But we can just rest on what he actually said. So I'm, I'm, I'm making this proposition. Friends, friends, friends. Let's come together. We can come together. We can do that. My, if we could come together together. We could change the world for the better, and we can do that. Number two. Number two, the how, when, and where of worship. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm going to worship. We're going to worship this morning. I always jokingly say we, we should worship as we go. But, but the idea that we're going to go somewhere. Now, now that's, that's not the idea that's uncommon to the Bible. Why, why our, uh, our, our Hebrew ancestors, they, they, they had to go to worship. Quite often they would make sometimes a, a, a perilous journey to go back to Jerusalem because of a special day, a special feast, a special observance. Does this statement today, spoken in the mouths of Christians, I'm going to worship, does that align with the teaching of Christ? Here's John 4, 20 through 24. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour's coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour's coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Does it appear to matter where worship is performed? Notice here that He's having a conversation with this Samaritan woman. And she was used to going up in this mountain and worship. Now that... That was a derivation from the, from the original worship of God, and they'd been doing that for some time, but, but that was counterfeit in every way. That was not in truth, because it was counterfeit. He says, no, if we're going to worship God, we've got to do it in truth. But, the, but then he goes on to explain, God is spirit. It makes sense that we would also, also rather worship Him in spirit. And, and we can do that wherever we are. We don't have to go somewhere in order to begin to worship God. So it is the how, when, and why of worship. Or I'm sorry, the how, when, and where of, uh, of worship. Worship is through the inner man. Let me explain what I mean. Basically, the Bible teaches that, that we are at least a dichotomy. 
We are at least body and spirit. And many times Jesus in his teachings uses that illustration of the body and spirit, okay? Um, here is once where the Apostle Paul uses this, speaking to the church at Corinth. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, right? I, I'm older than I've ever been, fatter than I've ever, uglier than I've ever been. The older man is decaying, yet the inner man is being renewed day by day. I wouldn't, listen, I wouldn't go back to being 18 years old again in Christ. I wouldn't do that for anything. Because I feel like that, that, that I've had an opportunity and, and, and I've got a lot of growth left. To do, but I, I, I love the fact that day by day I'm being renewed in Christ and trying to conform myself more and more into His very image. Philippians 3.3, 3, uh, the same author says, For we are the true circumcision, he's talking about we Christians, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. King James says that we worship God in the Spirit. In the Spirit. And that, and that would add up because God is Spirit. Our worship is done in the inner man. That's where the, that's where the event happens. That's where its worship is fulfilled, in the inner man. For, not, not the outer man. For example, a man in prison for his faith can still worship, can he? But he might not be able to go to a worship service. Now, there's elements of worship that he's going to have to miss out on unless he has some pretty friendly captors. He may not be able to participate in the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, sadly. But that doesn't stop him from worshiping. He may not be able to sing without getting a boot to the mouth. But that's not going to stop him from worshiping. Why? Because worship is in the inner man. But worship is expressed in the outer man. Participating in the Lord's Supper, fellowship, giving, singing, serving others. These are all ways, many more, that we express our worship. I like to say it like this. We let what's inside of us come out. In the inner man. Worship is expressed in the outer man. Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, I realize that there's a controversy here. This is the NASB's rendering. King James' rendering just calls it your reasonable service instead of your spiritual service of worship. And someone might take... Uh, offense at my use of worship here because I believe this, this text is talking about worship and not simply service. Service is expressed, is expressed worship. But service is done by the outward man. It is fueled, it is informed by the inner man. When is the proper time for worship? Well, this text says that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. So, so, so when does a sacrifice begin to be a sacrifice? I know that sounds like a silly question, but, but that happens when the sacrifice is offered. How long does a sacrifice remain a sacrifice? Once it's offered it remains a sacrifice perpetually. Unless it is fulfilled or something else better is offered in the case of Christ and the animal sacrifice. I think you can understand what I'm saying. When we become a Christian, this is what we're called to do, to be living in holy sacrifice. I, 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 don't, I don't go to worship and then stop worship and then let's go back to worship. We're always engaged in worship. That's our life. That's who we are in the inner man. Wherever we go, we can't always express our worship in the same way. And some worship we can't express except in an assembly. For example, fellowship. We couldn't express that worship by ourselves. So I don't want to take anything away from the assembly. What I want to say here is um, that all worship doesn't have to just happen in the assembly. Worship happens wherever we go and should happen 24-7. Can we sing 
give, serve, and fail to worship. Can we do those outward acts? Am I out of time? How much time? Okay. Can we do those outward acts? I'm sorry, I heard, I heard something. I thought I wasted my time. Can we sing, give, serve, and fail to worship? Yes. In Jesus' name, I could go and mow the widow's yard because she's down and out and she has nobody to help. I could do that, and that's certainly service, certainly an act of worship. If I hate my brother in my heart while I'm doing that, is that worship? Something's wrong. I can give. I can take my hand and give generously. But if I'm doing that with an ulterior motive, if I'm trying to buy your favor instead of trying to worship Christ, is that expression worth anything? If I'm singing, even in the assembly, but my mind is elsewhere, is it worship? Or is it just going through the motions? And see, this text talks about worship. Yeah, maybe the King James says service, but, but look, is it inward man, inner man or outward man that, that is not to be conformed to this world but transformed by the renewing of your mind? So that's the inward man. That's the fuel for everything the outward man is going to do. Did you know God is not worshipped outwardly? Now, now, expressions of worship are outward. But, but look at Acts 17, 25. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Now, the King James says that he's not worshipped by human hands. I think, I think it captures it. Worship is expressed outwardly yet fulfilled inwardly. Anything that is wrong or sinful that is performed in worship is wrong or sinful wherever worship is performed. And we have no New Testament verses that describe specific worship in an assembly, a worship service, for example, to the exclusion of general worship everywhere else. I just wanted to pause because I know that's going to hit different. Everywhere in the Bible that we have worship described, we never see an order of service, an order of worship, that and nothing else. Certainly what the New Testament talks about worship will inform what we do in our assemblies, in our services. But it also informs what we do outside of those services equally because it is not given specifically to an assembly. Third is the specificity of singing. Is singing... This term in the scripture, specific or general term. My colleague says that it is specific down the line and simply is vocal. So I want to ask you guys some questions because I'm going to disagree and I want to see if you can follow my logic. Were instruments of music used in the following texts? Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord. And said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider has been hurled into the sea. If we read that text, we see the word sing, song. Is it specific? This, of course, occurred after the crossing of the Red Sea, and they were very celebratory afterwards because Egypt had been thrown down. But yes, actually, instruments of music were included in this praise, Exodus 15, 20, 21, Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider has been hurled into the sea. How, how about this text? Were instruments of music used in this text? Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying... This was also another day of a great victory. And these were judges. And there's a whole song there in chapter 5 of Judges. My question is, did they sing with instrumental accompaniment? 
Not that we can find in the text. The entirety of the text says nothing about instrumental accompaniment. So here you have an example of singing, but it was with instruments of music. Here you have an example of singing, but there was no instruments of music. How about this one? Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a skillful song. Instruments here? Actually, there's no sign of instrumental accompaniment in this text, apart from clapping and shouting. What about this? This is just a portion of the verse. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Specific? Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises to our God on the lyre. If the term sing prohibits accompaniment, then why did the Hebrews speak of their instruments and the skill to play them? Now, during the captivity, it was a terrible and tragic time for the people of Israel. And we have this psalm that speaks about that time of, this, of their brokenness. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Now here's the question. The, the, what they were asked to do was sing songs of Zion. Why was it necessary for us to know that they had to hang their harps up? All they asked them to do was sing. Sing specific, right? Well, they wouldn't have needed harps. Why would he worry about his, his right hand losing its skill? How does God distinguish? 2 Chronicles 5, 12 through 14. All the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, Jedithan, their sons and kinsmen, clothed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres, standing east of the altar, and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets. In unison, when the trumpeters and singers were to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and glorify the Lord, and when they lifted up their voice, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, when they praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting, then the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud. So that the priest could not stand the minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord. No, notice, notice the instruments and vocals were heard with one voice. God, my colleague says that it's two different kinds of music. It's two different species, two different genus of music, two different. But, but what does the scripture say? God heard them with the same voice in unison. The King James is even more specific. It says that, that they were as one to make one sound. God didn't hear two sounds. Not the way that he accepted it. What about singing in the New Testament? For whatever was written in earlier times, written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. If, if in Ephesians 5, 17 through 19, and it writes, when, it, when it is written, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now, based on what the instruction from earlier times has stated, can we say that singing must be unaccompanied, that it must be specific, that it cannot be accompanied with instruments? We can say about our New Testament text here that the text forbids singing in the outer man alone. We can say that because it has to be in the heart. The heart instrument. Uh, again, the, the parallel verse, Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell, dwell, richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, with thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. If the heart is the instrument, my friends say the heart is the instrument, so that means you can just sing vocally. Does that mean we can only sing with the heart? If we understand the term heart, and it's heart and mind, I realize it's not just a blood pump, then we can see the point of the question. 
But look at these texts. Circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. Well, it can't be literal, right? It can't be a literal heart. That wouldn't make sense. Rend your heart and not your garments. We wouldn't say that that's literally the heart or literally the mind, right? The, the brain. It says, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. All that to say this. If the heart is the instrument, then, then that means no, there, there would be no vocals. If the brain is the instrument, there would be no vocals. If we take that literally, now if we're going to take that figuratively, which I believe we should, then that means that we do so with sincerity. Time? Thank you. We will now take five or two minutes for bathroom break.
Give me a second here. Get set up. Thank you again, each one, for giving your time to come out and study the Bible tonight. I want to express my true appreciation for Brother Derek's good spirit in presenting his material, and also the excellent demeanor of the audience, the people who think that debates cannot be conducted in a proper way, are just dead wrong, and you're proving it here tonight. We're discussing, of course, the proposition the New Testament authorizes singing and worship to the exclusion of instrumental music. The Bible includes the 27 New Testament books. We're under the authority of those books, and that's why I appeal to those books. It authorizes, it teaches, it instructs. So we're appealing to the passages in the New Testament that do that. Then singing in worship, singing is an act of worship to God, and to the exclusion of instrumental music simply means no other form of music is authorized. What is not authorized is excluded. The last several minutes of Derek's presentation, he was asking if singing is generic or specific, and he went through some passages in the Old Testament where you have some passages they just sang, and some they sang and used the instrument. And I agree with all of those passages. The point to understand is this. When the Bible says both singing and instruments, then both are authorized. Just like if you went into the store, you said, I want rice. Now, you've eliminated everything else. But if you said, I want rice and ice cream, you haven't eliminated the ice cream just by saying rice, when you introduced another specific, then they're both included. Mm -hmm. And so he has clearly shown in the Old Testament, both are included. And I also gave you the passage in 2 Chronicles 29, 25 to show when God wants to say that the instrument can be used, he says it directly. But when you go to the New Testament, you don't have both. So I hope you see that key point tonight. Uh, he mentioned that worship can be in the assembly or out, and I agree with that 100%. In 1 Corinthians 11, there is the discussion of coming together to eat the Lord's Supper in the assembly. And in chapter 14, coming together for edification in the assembly. But by the same token, we can read in Acts 16.25, Paul in prison saying, that's not the assembly. So I agree it can be in the assembly or out of the assembly so far as that part goes. But whether it's in or out, here's the key point we're looking for. What instruction did God give for worship? And you've seen the passages, sing, 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 Sometime in the assembly, sometime not in the assembly, but it was sing. So, I want to remind you that the New Testament pattern reveals clearly singing and worship. Music is a general term inclusive of both, but you can't read, make music. Now, you have specifics within that category. Singing is vocal, playing is instrumental. They're both specifics, and when both are indicated, both are acceptable. If the New Testament said make music in worship, then both could be done. Or if the New Testament said in some verses sing, and in some it said sing and play, just like Derek showed us in the Old Testament, right? There were some verses sing, and then some sing and play. 
So now if we can find that same thing in the New Testament, some will say sing, and some will say sing and play, we'll shake hands right there. But we can't. That's simply not to be found. And so Christ has authorized singing in Matthew 26, 30, when they had sung in him. In Acts 16, 25, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. Romans 15, 9, sing unto thy name. But when Derek read us some passages from the Old Testament, it would say sing, but then there was the lyre, and then there was the harp, and then there was the psaltery. See that? But what we're finding in the New Testament, there's no harp, there's no lyre, there's no psaltery. But 1 Corinthians 14, 15, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding. Ephesians 5, 19, speaking. This is worship with the speaking of words to yourself, simultaneous reciprocal. When I'm speaking to you, you're speaking to me. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, the speaking is in the form of singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, simultaneous reciprocal action. And again, Colossians 3.16, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And I like his point about worship has to be rooted from the depths of the heart. I agree with that. But notice in this passage now, what is in the heart must overflow on the lips by singing. So there is the inner man and the outer man in union in worship. All right, so again, it was simultaneous and reciprocal action here. That was in the assembly. In Hebrews 2, 12, in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee? No mention of the lyre, no mention of the harp. You see that? Hebrews 13, 15, the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, James 5, 13, is any merry, let him sing psalms. And so here is all that the New Testament gives us on saints singing the praises of God engaging in worship on this earth as we all would want to do. And not any of these passages included the harp, the lyre, or any other instrument. So that's the difference. If you just say rice, it excludes everything else. If you say rice and ice cream, then it includes both. So I agree with him when he can read those passages where it said singing and then the harp, then it includes both. But did you notice he did not read us even one verse in the New Testament that showed us that? Did anybody notice that? Not even one verse. Singing is authorized by direct command in Ephesians 5.19, by approved example in Acts 16.25, and by necessary implication in Hebrews 13.15. And he agreed with me and I with him. That's the way language functions. And so that is how God's authority is expressed regarding worship. Now, the first point that he made in response to my material is that all that God has not repealed continues in force. And he referred to passages like 2 Timothy 3. Uh, Timothy was raised on the Old Testament scriptures, and we certainly agree to that. But I want to call your attention now to this. The law of Moses has been nailed to the cross. The whole system was removed. We don't have to find a verse that says the Old Testament allowed the instrument, but the New Testament doesn't. We don't have to find a verse that said the Old Testament had burning of incense, but the New Testament doesn't. The whole Old Testament system is nailed to the cross. It fulfilled its purpose, and it had a good purpose, but it is finished. In Hebrews 10, verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, the first covenant. So it's been removed, it's been repealed in total, that he may establish the second, which is the new covenant, the New Testament, and that's where we must make our appeal and that's where we find seeing every time. So, the Old Testament system has completely been ended. 
he made the excellent point that where there is no law, there is no sin. And he gave several good passages on that. I will shake hands on that. Now then, consider this, please. When God said build an ark, here is a general statement, but there were specifics. He specified the wood. He, by telling them to build an ark, included tools that would have to be used. They are not mentioned because they are included in the command. But now notice concerning additions, oak, pine, coconut, wood. Now somebody could say, well, where there's no law, there's no sin, so you go ahead and use that. But the key is this. There is a law when it says go for wood. There's the law. Did everybody see that? There's the law right there. When I said in the grocery store, give me rice, that's the statement that it excludes everything else. I don't have to name them off. So there's a law right there. And if he used oak and pine and coconut, even though there's no verse, do not use oak, it would have been a violation. I know we can see that. Now when we come to baptism, but it specified that must be immersion, going down in the water, coming up out of the water, it includes aids inherent in the command. But additions would be sprinkling and pouring. Now if Derek and I were to unite in debating a Presbyterian preacher, the Presbyterian preacher would say to us, where there's no law, there's no sin, and there's no verse that says do not sprinkle. How would we answer that? Would that mean sprinkling is authorized? We'd answer it just like this. When the New Testament specified immersion, it doesn't have to say do not sprinkle. That's inherent in the meaning of the command itself. Because it specifies one thing in a class of things. When we come to the Lord's Supper, Many passages give us the general teaching to observe it, but there are specifics included. Only the first day of the week must be the right elements, the right meaning. All of that is specified. Such thing as the time of day or the containers is not even mentioned because it's included in the command itself. But how about a Saturday Lord's Supper? Is there a verse, do not have the Lord's Supper on Saturday? Now there are churches that have the Lord's Supper on Saturday. But when he said first day of the week, then it cannot be Saturday. That excluded Saturday. Did you know some of the denominations literally are having ham and Coke or they'll have hamburgers and Coca-Cola on the Lord's table? And their response to us would be, where well, there's no law, there's no sin. And what they mean is, there's no verse that says, do not use hamburgers and Coke. And they're right on that. But what they're missing is how does language work? When the Lord specified the elements, two elements, unleavened bread, fruit of the vine, no others are mentioned. It excludes all other foods from that Lord's Supper. And so that brings me to the point again. Singing. Oh, there are many general statements. We've read them. Ephesians 5.19. But specifying it that when you make melody, it's by singing, aids are included, additions are excluded. It doesn't help to say where there's no law, there's no sin. There's a law. The law is sing. See? Just like the elements are the fruit of the vine, unleavened bread. There's a law. The day is the first day. There's a law. There's no verse, do not do it on Saturday. There's no verse, do not play instruments, but there's a law. And this is where we can be united. This is the unity ground, if we will stand on this ground. Well, again, he made the good point from 2 Peter chapter 1, 3, and 4, that all things pertaining to life and godliness have been given to us. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Look at it right there. Here they are, folks. When it comes to our worship in music, here it is, all of it. That's every verse about worship in New Testament times among the saints of God on this earth. So 2 Peter 1, all things pertaining to life and godliness. And how is singing authorized again? 
direct command, approved example, necessary implication. All things pertaining to life and godliness, it's been given to us, without a doubt, without a question. Well, uh, we talked about uh, Romans 12, so let's give attention to that. I'm trying not to overlook anything that he brought up. So the argument is all life is sur- uh, the, that all life is worship. But that argument won't stand the test of Scripture. All life is service, but not all is worship. Now, service is used in the translation of Romans 12.1 in King James Version, New King James, American Standard, and many others. Yes, it has been changed to worship in some new translations, but it's not accurate. Notice that all worship is service. Is that not true? All worship is a service to God we render, but not all service is worship. Not when I drove here today, that was not worship. When I mowed the yard the other day, that's not worship. When the mother changes the baby's diaper, that's not worship. Is it service? You bet it is. Yes, sir, 100%, 24-7. All worship is service, not all service is worship. You know, all the apostles were disciples. But not all disciples were apostles, right? They were not all apostles. So those two should be distinguished just like service and worship. In Genesis 22, 5, remember when Abraham went to offer Isaac and he traveled for three days. Stay with me. Those three days were not the worship. He said in 22, 5 to the servants with him, you wait here and we will go on to the place to worship. Do you see that? Their service included the travel, but that wasn't the worship. So all service is not worship. That's not a good, accurate translation. In John 16, 2, Jesus said, time will come that those who oppose you will think they are doing God's service when they persecute you and kill you. Well, now, when they would kill Christians, they didn't think that was an act of worship. They thought it was a service. But that's the same word, service, in that verse and in Romans 12, 1, same Greek word. In Acts 10, 25, when Peter came in to preach to Cornelius, first he met him, Cornelius greeted him, but then, remember, he fell down at his feet to worship him. Now, if all... If all service is worship, then when he greeted Peter, that was worship. No, no, the text says he fell down to worship him. See, that's different. All worship is service, yes, but not all service is worship. That's not accurate. That's not a good translation. Well, I want to consider with you this. What is revealed versus what is not revealed? This is the difference between the church of Christ and others. The instrument is not the only thing. God is glorified by what is revealed. And I think we would agree on that principle. Remember in Leviticus 10, 1 to 3, Nadab and Abihu added another fire. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, put fire therein, and put incense thereon, which, by the way, was the service they were supposed to do and offered strange fire before the Lord. What does that mean? What is strange fire? Which he commanded them not. The Lord said, get the fire for the incense from the altar at the front of the tabernacle. And maybe they just reasoned, well, where there's no law, there's no sin, it doesn't say do not make a different fire, so we'll just go ahead and make a different fire. A fire he commanded not. See, that's like the Lord gave singing But in the New Testament, the instrument he commanded them not. Well, they went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Now that seems severe. Why did the Lord do that? Moses said to Aaron, this is that that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me and before all the people I will be glorified. 
when we follow God's exact instruction from the heart, as he emphasized, it must always come from the heart. But when we do this, God is glorified and sanctified. But when we offer a strange fire, God is not glorified and sanctified. In Matthew 15, 8 and 9, you remember Jesus discussing this when he said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me. And again, that sounds severe to modern ears. That just sounds severe. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Human additions nullify the worship meaning God does not accept it as true worship. And so I appeal again to 1 Peter 4, 11. God is glorified when we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where it is silent. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. That's divine revelation that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So I'm going to take a few minutes. <clears throat> be sure and keep me up on the time there. I'm just trying to help clarify the instrument is not the only difference. When the instrument was introduced back in the 1800s, it opened the door to move in a different direction that included many things. And I just want to outline some of this. Now first, let me start where we can agree. What is revealed versus what is not revealed. Thank you. In Romans 6, 3 and 4, baptism is immersion because you must be buried and raised. That's what is revealed. Sprinkling and pouring is not revealed. And it doesn't help to say, now where there's no law, there's no sin. There's no verse, do not sprinkle. That's no help because the law is immersion. There's a law. That automatically excludes the sprinkling. In Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Why are they described that way? They belong to Christ. The emphasis is always on the Savior and our King and our Head. But now what is not revealed is Catholic churches, Methodist churches, Baptist churches, and other human names. Not revealed. Now somebody could say, well, there's no law, there's no sin. There's no verse that says, do not wear the name Methodist. Does anybody know a verse that says do not use the name Methodist? If you do, when we dismiss, give me that verse. No, you don't know that verse. It doesn't exist. Do not use the name Methodist. It doesn't exist. But the Lord told us what the church is. It is the church of Christ. And that excludes all of these other things. Now in Acts 14, 23, elders were appointed in every congregation as men were qualified and in 1 Peter 5, verse 2, they could only oversee the flock among you. Elders had authority only in the local church. God designed local church organization and nothing above that tying the churches together. They were independent and autonomous in function. But now, what is not revealed is centralized organizations. We see it in many forms. You have the Catholic hierarchy from the Pope on down. In denominations, you have your headquarters and councils and all kinds of denominational organizations tied to the churches. But now I mentioned the instrument is not our only difference. In the 1800s, after the instrument became more accepted, human institutions supported by churches became more accepted. They created evangelistic associations, missionary societies with their president, their board of directors, and they took money from the churches and then they went ahead with supporting those things. Is that why we're here? Excuse me, I'll just use my time the best way I can. Let's don't interrupt each other. Okay, I'll leave. I'm just explaining that the instrument is... Excuse me, I won't interrupt you. Okay, I understand it. Sometimes tensions get a little bit up. I'm not saying any of this to embarrass you. I'm trying to explain that it opened a door to move in a different direction. And so that churches donate money to human institutions, colleges, and all kinds of institutions. And the Christian church is not the only one. Since the 1950s, some churches of Christ are doing it. So I'll address our folks, not just you, 
But I'm discussing the principle that we're trying to adhere to what is revealed and not be pulled in a direction what is not revealed. In the New Testament, it is revealed, Ephesians 4.11, Philippians 1 verse 1, that we have elders in the local church, including the word pastors and bishops, meaning the same. And we have deacons and evangelists and teachers. But here's what is not revealed. Having a pope, having priests, having a president, having a bishop of a diocese, a district supervisor, female pastors. We see all of those things. And in some of the Christian churches, I don't think that the white brethren here would agree to that, they have women pastors. They have women in the pulpits. And this followed from the instrument being introduced that they began to say again, where there's no law, there's no sin, and the, where they think there's no specific prohibition, they can go ahead. But we need to stop. Silence prohibits. In Matthew 26, the Lord's Supper is given with unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. That's revealed. What is not revealed is loaf bread and water. That is the Mormon Lord's Supper. Hamburger and Coke. Some denominations say we do that to bring the young people. Then look but not eat the Lord's Supper. That's the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then some say we can have a full meal. My only point is to help you clarify. Sometimes things are revealed but then there are things not revealed. And when we don't have Bible authority, we can't go that direction. In Acts 20, verse 7, we are to eat the Lord's Supper every Sunday. But what is not revealed is a Lord's Supper annually, as is practiced by many, quarterly, as practiced by many, even daily in the Catholic cathedral. But there are other religions that never have a Lord's Supper. Do those things matter? I believe they do because we're trying to adhere to what is revealed. And so this explains now why I'm mentioning those other things. I'm trying to develop a principle and convince you the principle is right. It is right to stay on the track we do what is revealed. We speak where the Bible speaks. Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, all saints sing and from the heart. Amen to that point. It was simultaneous reciprocal worship. But here's what is not revealed. Instrumental music, solo singing, choirs, concerts, clapping, dancing, praise team. There's no verse for those things. But over here, oh, we can find many verses for what is revealed. 1 Timothy 3.15, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. In Acts 2.42, they assemble to worship. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 1, the church's work was evangelism and worship and benevolence to saints. That's what we learn in these passages. But here's what is not revealed. The denominations have been doing these things for years, but many of the Christian churches have been drifting that same way. It's because of the same principle we're discussing about the instrument. Having politics and recreation, supporting camps with church money, taking money, sending to a human institution, social services such as daycare centers and food banks, conducting schools, kindergarten and elementary, medical services sponsored by the church, having kitchens and dining halls and other practices. And again, I don't mention these things in an attempt to embarrass people. I'm here to study. My point of study is this. We're trying to speak where the Bible speaks by doing what is revealed, not just on the singing. We're trying to be consistent in applying that principle on all things. But on the other side, what is not revealed, well, the instrument is not revealed in the New Testament, and these other things are not revealed. So when we step out to do things not revealed, where's the stopping place? There's not any stopping place. The truth is, by the Lord not revealing those things, we should stop preaching and practicing those things. Silence forbids. Silence does not authorize. When the Lord said they sang and they used the lyre, then good, we have Bible ground for that. But when the Lord simply says sing, we must not step beyond that to say, but we want to have our harp, our guitar, our piano. Silence does forbid when God speaks what is his will in these matters. 
So thank you again that you have been so patient to listen to both Derek and myself, and I want you to give the same good attention to him that you've given to me. And we are so thankful for his presence and for your presence. Truly, we love you all. You may disagree with me, but that won't stop us from let's love each other. I know we can do that. Thank you. Thank you again. I'd like to begin this second section by thanking you for, for your decorum. I, I appreciate that so much and apologize for an outburst. Um, but let's, let's begin. I, I, really wanna, I really want to address some, some of the things that, um, that my colleague has, uh, has differed with us on. And I'm gonna try to give, uh, give equal time to, uh, to the things that he said. As, as much as I could, uh, as I could follow along. Thank you, thank you once again. Um, my colleague said that we are under the authority of the New Testament. Uh, that certainly is true. Uh, but the Bible says that all Scripture, all Scripture, is God breathed and profitable. And I, I read that earlier in my demonstration, and that's why that I have so many. Uh, of the Old Testament references that I gave to you before. Now, I, those, those references that I gave you that, that fell into the category of the Law of Moses, um, I do not believe any of those are authorized for us today. I agree um, with my colleague that the Law of Moses has been nailed to the cross. I agree with that. Um, at the same time, the Law of Moses does not constitute the entirety of what we commonly refer to as the Old Testament. Maybe that's a poor way to say it, um, but the Old Testament is much larger than the Law of Moses. And there are things in the Old Testament that have not been repealed. And so that might be where we differ because um, of, a, of a statement um, that, and, and correct me if I'm misquoting you, whole Old Testament system is nailed to the cross. Okay. Um, I would disagree with that. Um, if that's the case, let's, let's define what, what is the whole Old Testament system. Um, there can't be a changing of the testament until there's the death of the testator, right? And then the will must be read. So if we want to be very specific about how we define that, it would be anything preceding the day of Pentecost, and certainly anything preceding the death of Christ, would fall under. So that would be the majority of your Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John texts, as well as whatever precedes it, going all the way back to Genesis, if we are to say the entirety of the Old Testament system. But the Bible says in the New Testament, again, all Scripture, all Scripture is profitable. And that was spoken in the New Testament era. So that is why that I have the difference um, that I find myself having. Uh, my colleague said that God knows how to authorize instruments. And, and that's another true statement. 
But the statement that I made earlier about commands, promises, and warnings, anything that God has not repealed, God knows how to authorize the instruments. God knows how to authorize whatsoever He has commanded, promised, or warned us. He also knows how to repeal those things. He also knows how to repeal those things. My question is, when a thing is authorized, how long does it remain so? Until we have to understand that it has been repealed. If, if nothing is said about something that is authorized, how long does it remain so? Um, an example that I would give is if we're driving down 75, I took I-75 on the way up, and I passed several signs that said the speed limit was 70. If uh, we find ourselves passing one of those signs and, and, and almost instantaneously we are pulled over by an officer of the law, right under that sign that says 70, and he walks up to us, license and registration, and he says, you know how fast you're going? Actually, I do. I was doing 71. He said, yeah, you're doing 71 and a 55. I'm going to write you a ticket. I said, wait a minute. Look at the sign. It says 70. Oh, no, that was repealed. It's actually 55. So, but the sign still says 70, doesn't it? Well, no. It's actually 55 regardless of what. See, we would have a case in court. Now, now you might you might want to be argumentative with the with the police officer and say, well, where, where do you where do you get that when he, well well the governor office changed and when the governor's office changed, this law changed with it. And you say, well, wait a minute, I'm not the best civic student, but doesn't the legislature create and pass laws? Why would the governor changing office have anything to do with that? Now, sadly, there's a lot of executive orders sometimes that comes out of our offices of government, but the way that it's supposed to work, that, that, that's not how it's supposed to work. So why would there be a change? But we would have to be informed. If we're not informed of that change, I think we have a case before the court. <clears throat> um, why do we not baptize infants? Or why do we not sprinkle? And I think this will really help um, for, for the, for the, you know, the time that we have going forward uh, the rest of this evening and tomorrow. We do not deny that if the Bible specifies something, that we do that. We, we do not deny that. Uh, if the Bible specifies fruit of the vine and unleavened bread, we do that. We are not saying that the principle of where there is no law, there is no sin, is a principle that allows us to substitute what God has specified. Now, I want to say that again. When, when I quote that principle where there's no law, there's no sin, I am not advocating for substituting what God has said um, with any of my own opinions or with any traditions or so on, and several things were listed there. Okay, so I want, I want to be in the affirmative that, that it, what God says matters as he said it. <clears throat> We don't baptize uh, infants, not because of what the Bible hasn't said, but because of what it has said. An infant would not be a candidate for baptism because an infant can't repent, for example, and probably doesn't have the capacity to believe. I think we'd all agree with that. So not be a candidate for baptism. It's not, it's not because of what wasn't said. It's because of what is said. Baptism is a specific term. Very specific. We do not have a we do not have a history going back into um, what we would call the Old Testament times, where baptism was sprinkling or pouring to somehow muddy that water. We have a very uh, a very specific term there. I spent a long time going through the presentation earlier, showing how that the term "sing" it does not have the same presence as the term baptism. It is, it is specific in this regard that it is vocal, but it does not specify whether or not it has accompaniment. Can, can, I, can I try to illustrate that? I sang a solo last night. Did I sing with instruments or did I sing without accompaniment? We don't know, do we? We have to have heard the song, 
We have to have more information. Because sing is not a specific term in that regard. Yes, it requires vocalization, but it can or cannot have accompaniment. I was not trying to quote the passages that I quoted, uh, several of those coming out of the Law of Moses, as an authority for me to sing today. That's not, that was not my purpose. My purpose was to prove to you that in, in the Bible's context and its usage, that the term sing is not as specific a term as my colleague has, has a, a, a illustrated to us. It is, it is specific in vocalization, but does not specify whether or not accompaniment is present. And we have many examples there. When we see this term in the New Testament, how do we understand this term? A hard reset? Or, as I quoted from the scriptures, when it talks about the things that were written of old, that those things are for our instruction, I'm going back to those things to find out, is the term sing specific as just vocalization alone? Or is it with or without accompaniment? And that's what I found over and over again as I surveyed the Old Testament. Remember, all Scripture, all Scripture, it's God-breathed, all of it, is profitable. So I go back there for the prophet, and I determine my terms based on not, not my opinions or not based on uh, how we would use that word today, even though today, as I gave you an example, we still use that word um, without that kind of specificity. I sang a solo last night. Was I accompanied? Maybe. We don't know by that term. The Bible seems to agree. Um, I want to deal with the term one another. One another. Um, my colleague said that when we have the texts from Ephesians 5:19, uh, from Philippians, I'm sorry, from Colossians 3:16, uh, because it says sing to one another, that that is a um, a simultaneous reciprocal action. Am I misrepresenting that? Okay, thank you. Is a simultaneous reciprocal action um, simply because it says that? Uh, just a cursory survey of the scriptures. Uh, if we think about the term one another, if you, just, if, if you just punch that into your search and look up one another, do we find uh, that pattern throughout? That that is simultaneous reciprocal action? Or do we find other examples? Now, I found so many, I don't want to bother you with, uh, with uh, going through the old and the... I'll give you a New Testament passage. Please... Please don't do this because I quoted this passage. 1 Peter 5.14 says, Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ Jesus. And if you want to greet me, if you want to fulfill this, that's fine. Give me my hand, you can kiss it. <laughs> but it says to do that to one another. Now, one thing that I'm not going to agree with is that that should be simultaneous reciprocal action. Um, that might get us in trouble. So I'm going to disagree that, that what, what does that mean in that text? That means at some point we greet each other, right? But it doesn't have to be simultaneous. I want to use that as a leverage for the texts in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 that talks about that we speak to one another, we teach and admonish one another, that, that we don't have to do that simultaneously. It is reciprocal. I agree totally, but simultaneously it does not have to be to fulfill that text uh, any more than it has to be to fulfill any of the other texts that we see that speaks about what we do with one another uh, in the church. So that would be my position. <clears throat> the Lord's Supper. Uh, we can't have ham and coke. I, I totally agree, because the Lord's Supper has specified fruit of the vine and unleavened bread. Now, if we practice the entire Old Testament system has been nailed to the cross and no longer can inform us 
of, um, of, of anything of, I wouldn't say of importance, but has no um, practice in our religion. We would not know what to put in that cup. For only the words of Christ told us that, that it was the fruit of the vine, but when we come to the other teachings in the New Testament, we hear about the cup, and we hear about the loaf, but we don't know what to put in the cup. We have to go back to something that was stated in the Old Testament um, system, if I could say it that way, and that you could understand uh, what I'm trying to say. Um, let's talk about Nadab and Abihu. I appreciate him bringing up Nadab and Abihu. Um, and and it, it, what he said there about, about, about the terrible thing that happened uh, to Nadab and Abihu, um, it, it was, and it seems almost like that it violates this basic principle of no law, no sin. Uh, now, we find out seven, six, seven chapters later um, that you weren't allowed to use unauthorized fire. The problem is, is that comes later than, than the event of their untimely death. So, so you say to yourself, well, was it fair that God lashed out and killed these guys, but they didn't know that they weren't allowed to offer that fire that way? It seems like that they were guilty of sin, although there was not a specific law attached to that. But there were laws attached. There were. Um, and and I, I won't read the text for you, but I'll give them to you for your consideration. Strange incense was forbidden. Exodus 30 and verse 9. They were not allowed to use but a specific type of incense to put that into the censer, and then they put fire to that. That was absolutely forbidden. And it appears that Moses kept this in some way when the, when the, when the uh, uh, tabernacle was being made and the items of the tabernacle, when we read in Exodus 39, 38 and following, we find that those things were presented to Moses. And there's no indication that Nadab and Abihu got that, um, uh, that right or perfect incense. Um, we, we can do very little with an inference there because it has to be uh, without any doubt. We don't know that they offered the proper incense and it appears they probably didn't because they were acting uh, very irrationally uh, following the events of, uh, of what happened that day. And Moses and Aaron had been in the tabernacle and had just come back out. So if they, um, it would have required Moses to go directly to Nadab and Abihu, give them the proper incense, and, uh, and, and then we would still. But even then, um, they were likely drunk. Leviticus 10, 9, uh, right after this happens, and their bodies are probably still being displayed, uh, or at least they're being cleaned up, Moses turns and says, when you're serving here, you do it without being drunk. Now that's the paraphrase. Go back and get the verse. Leviticus 10, 9. He says, you, you're going to have to take this serious. You can't do this in an inebriated state. No drinking here. And the Bible said in, in Exodus 19, 22, that you will consecrate yourself before the Lord. That means be holy. Be holy before the Lord. Um, if you present yourself drunk before the Lord, that would be the opposite of consecration. And the Bible says, lest the Lord should lash out against you, which is precisely what he did. So there seems to have been a comedy of errors there. But I think my, I, I, I'm, I'm nearly certain that my principle of no law, no sin, will stand the test of Nadab and Abihu. Um, also, Romans 12, I, I would like to, uh, uh, I know that there is, uh, so there, he, he named several translations that uh, just say service instead of your reasonable worship. I can name just as many that say worship. And uh, so, so what do you do when you come up against something like that, which just, you know, 
I prefer this, I prefer that, but it seems like the experts disagree. Well, number one, context. Context. Verse 2 tells us that we're not to be conformed to this world. That's what an outward man would do, that the outwardness is informing his inner man, right? That happens all the time. People leave the church because their outwardness, their outward desires is informing the inner man. It says, no, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is inner man informing the outward man. And that very much seems to be worship. As I said before, we can offer externally worship to God, but if the inner man is not connected, it isn't worship at all. So I think Romans 12 will stand the test of that being worshipful. But even if it were to fall... Philippians 3.3 3 tells us very plainly we worship God in spirit. Jesus said very plainly, and it's, it's, it's not debated in John chapter 4. We worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that's everywhere we go. Um, my colleague said that he doesn't worship God in, in the vehicle. I wish you'd reconsider. It's a wonderful place to worship God. Because we're always engaged in worship. The Bible says to pray without ceasing, right? Where then is proper to pray? In all places. Does that mean because we sleep that we've sinned? Well, no. But we pray without ceasing. We also are worshiping. We are always connected, the inner man. Without, see, the inner man is being renewed day by day. The inner man is not only renewed when we come together in an assembly. So anything that would not be proper to do in the assembly is not proper to do outside of the assembly. We're always engaged in worship. Always. <clears throat> There's one slide here that I didn't get to cover before, and I'd like to come back to it. And uh, it is dealing with our, with our text here. Um, with our, with, let, let's consider what I'm saying about seeing and that, and that term not being uh, specifically to the exclusion of an instrument as we see that you know, throughout uh, the scriptures. Does that allow us, the New Testament then, to use that as a springboard to understand what seeing can mean when we have texts like speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart unto the Lord. If the term of sing can be company, then everybody must play instruments and sing to please God, right? Now, we demonstrated that in times of old, aforetime, that wasn't the case. And that they seemed to have flexibility they could choose to sing with accompaniment or without. God allowed that. He honored it. He never punished anybody because of that. And it was never, there was a lot of things they did wrong, but that, was, that never made the list. <clears throat> Look at Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. This is talking about the sanctuary, right? This is talking about in what we, the temple... Um, but it's also talking about outside. The expanse here, it's actually the word the heavens or the sky. It's basically just saying everywhere under the sky, praise him. How? Harp and lyre, timbrel and dancing, stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals, praise him with resounding cymbals. So they had a command, didn't they? An imperative to praise him under the sky. There's, they were free to praise him outside of the assembly and within the assembly, right? Here's my question. If they're commanded to do so with instrumental accompaniment, and one of those Hebrews didn't play an instrument, did they sin? Did they fail to fulfill God's will? And, and I, I've already quoted to you a, a text where they hung up their harps and said, how can we? How can we? When we're not in Jerusalem. 
Now, I know sometimes tragedy hits us, and you don't really feel like singing a song, and it hurts you, but, but, you know, a lot of you would say, well, I'm commanded to do it, I'm going to do it anyway. It's, it's the Lord's day, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to sing, because I'm commanded to do it. Maybe you've been in that situation. And maybe you, you went through the motions, but you just couldn't think about the words that were before you because of your brokenness. Um, was it worship? If you're totally distracted, if you didn't have the right things on your hearts and minds because all you could think about was what's going on in your life, well, I'm not going to say it wasn't. But it was certainly distracted worship, wasn't it? You're doing your best. You're doing your best. But really, it doesn't really define the inward man and the outward man completely connected in the expression of worship, does it? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that person sinned. I'm not saying that person... That person's just hurting. But I'm saying circumstances a lot of times, you know, forbids us from being able to, to, to worship God the way we'd like to with the inner man. And we can still express it but it makes a problem for us, doesn't it? These, in the Old Testament, were commanded to do it. And they were commanded. But not everybody played all... And listen, it wouldn't just be, well, I can play the harp. You'd have to play harp, lyre, psaltery, timbrel, timbrel, the dance, cymbals, everything, right, to fulfill that command as it is written. I have to play it all because I'm told to praise Him on all of those. I don't think every Hebrew in Israel could play all those instruments. <clears throat> and I think we have learned because all Scripture, remember that, all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching. And so I'm taking the Scripture and I'm teaching the principle there and I'm applying that to the New Testament as well as a principle. And I'm looking over my list, and I think I've addressed most of these. Uh, most of these. So let me just spend the next few minutes with you, just to say this. I haven't said it in a while. We can come together. We can come together. We can work together. When we advertise that we're going to debate over the instrument, the people in our community that aren't Christian Church, Church of Christ, they don't understand that. And if anything, they, they think it's silly. And in their mind, they think that, that we're, we're debating over whether, for example, a piano will send you a hail if everything else is, is the same. And you'll say, well, that's not fair, and they don't understand the arguments, and it's true, they don't. They don't. And, and I totally agree with, with, uh, with, with my colleague that it really is an authority issue. And the instrument just happens to be a part of that. The instrument is highlighted in that. It's highlighted in that. What if, just, just imagine, what if we came together in such a way that the newspaper was able to say, these brethren set aside their differences and came together. What would that do? What would that do to public opinion? If we could just do that, we can do it. We can do that. We have a small start right here. I thank you for your time.
to thank both these preachers for their efforts. It has been mentioned that at this time we have allowed and allotted a 20 minute period for questions from the congregation and uh, the audience. And if you have a written question you'd like to submit to any of the speakers at this time, this would be the time to do it. Who's going to be the first one? Anybody have a question, a written question? God, I'm having some turned in right here. Sir? I have one turned in here for Ron. I can, I can read it off of the book. Let him read it. Well, that, that's why I want it written down. Four questions, and he needs to time me because we said each one could have two minutes, and I need to give him equal on each of each. Mm -hmm. So if you'll, you just take one of them. I, well, I'll read the question. I'll okay. make some comments. I don't have to go full two minutes. But my point is, I can't go over two minutes, and then I need to let him comment on the same question. Okay. 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 Who decides what is an aid or an addition? Example: harmonica versus pitch harmonica. <coughs> That's decided by the nature of language itself. I had mentioned in a grocery store I might ask for rice. It's inherent in the way language communicates. The rice will be in a bag or a box. They don't pour it in my hands. So it's in the nature of language itself that you distinguish those things. When a harmonica is added to the worship, you've got rice plus ice cream. You've added something in the same class of things, and you've added something. So that would be excluded. That's an addition. The pitch pipe is not used as an act of worship. It's only the song leader getting a sound for his ear. He's not worshiping. He puts it down. Then he starts leading the worship. So that's the distinction I would make. It's according in the nature of language. You can distinguish which is which. That's enough for me. I'll let you Thank you, my friend. Hmm? Um, my my comment here would be that I would not I would not base that simply on language rules. Um, there's a lot of languages out there, and the rules differ. It, instead, what I would what I would say is is we would actually just need a word from the Lord on that. And if we had a word from the Lord, that would that would just make that certain. And uh, and I can say this, and I really I, I, we get into the argument over aids and additions. I would like to give my, my position on that would, would just be this, that anything that, that, that my friend would offer as, a, as evidence for why a pitch pipe is acceptable would be the same thing that I would offer as to why a harmonica would be acceptable as an aid to, uh, to, to worship. So, but I would want to see Scripture. I would want to see Scripture that tells me that answer. Thank you. Second question, when does a Christian's worship begin and end? That would depend on what God has defined as an act of worship. The Lord's Supper has a beginning and an ending. You've completed that act of worship. When we dismiss the service and go home or go to the hamburger place and eat, that's not the worship. So in other words, the Bible doesn't define that as worship. I've already said it could be considered service, to be sure. We're serving God every moment. But the Bible itself defines what is an act of worship. Um, so you've heard the term lip service, right? Um, worship is heart and mind service. It's basically what our heart and mind is informing us. And our body reacts to that based on whether our worship is true or counterfeit. I, I, would, I would highlight the necessity that when we are at the hamburger place, that is, even, even the highlight, that's the place where we want to be worshiping. We want to be seen in that way. Now, I'm not saying that we want to stand up and sing a song. I'm not saying that at all. 
What I'm saying is that's the place where our inner man needs to be connected and so that we will be the example in love and service as we express worship in those ways to the people around us. So, uh, so, and, and I think from my speech you heard me say that I don't, I, I don't think worship ever ends once a Christian becomes a Christian. Number three is praise and worship with instruments of music authorized outside of the Christian assembly. Why or why not? <clears throat> When we worship God, whether it's private or public worship, we would want to be informed by the scriptures. What does he want as worship? Some of the verses that I quoted, and he doesn't just read it those verses, uh, some would be the, a symbol to worship, but some, like James 5, is just as any one Mary let him sing a song. So, uh, what I'm saying is neither in the public arena or in the private, does the scripture say God wants us to worship him with an instrument? Uh, Psalm 150 mentions dancing as well. They use that in the Old Testament. Uh, they use incense in the Old Testament. There's no verse in the New Testament that says do not burn incense, do not dance. But those things are not authorized by Christ and should not be considered as appropriate worship, uh, public or private. Praying to Mary is not authorized, so it shouldn't be done in the public assembly or in a private way. So the point I'm trying to make is just we search the scripture to see what does God want as worship, not I decide I'm going to do X and let God consider this as my worship. Um, my, my position is we should be consistent either within or without. I, I, I applaud you for your consistency because I, this is the third such debate that I've been a part of. And the uh, first two, this was not the position of the non-instrumentalists. Um, they actually said that, out, literally was said you can pull up in the parking lot, listen to Caleb with your hands out the window, but once you cross the threshold at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, no instruments. So I, I, I do applaud you for your consistency. Um, we, we don't pray through Mary, not because of what the Bible hasn't said. We pray, we, we pray, we do not pray through Mary because the Bible said we pray in Jesus' name. Specified. So, so I, that 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 would be my answer to, to that. Well, I don't want to do more. Number four, if we agreed on all all other issues other than instruments, would we be condemned to hell? Well, it's not my personal right or prerogative to tell who's going to heaven and hell. God will do that at the judgment. But, let me back up and say, think about passages like Matthew 7, when we try to understand how will God do this. Well, in Matthew 7 and verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So God is going to judge me based on, did I do his will? That's what I should be teaching people. Sometime when we preach on baptism, and I do a lot of open forums in the Philippines, and so somebody will come up with a question like this, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but what if a tree fell on him? when he was going to the waters of baptism. And that's their way of proving you don't have to be baptized. And they want me to tell, does that person go to heaven or hell? I don't bite on that ploy. I'm to preach, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. But God will judge the individual soul. That's his realm. That's not my realm. But I should teach what God teaches, whether it's baptism, singing, Lord's Supper, or whatever, understanding that he said that's how he's going to judge us all. We find agreement. Not this time. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Just a little levity. Uh, I, I will say from my position, I, I won't condemn you guys because you don't use the instrument. Um, and I, to, to, to echo what my friend is saying, I don't want that job. I, 
But we'll leave that to Christ who, gets, right. who has to go to hell. Right. I don't want that job. I just want to preach. I just want to preach what Jesus has said. And, um, and folks can walk away or folks can embrace it. But um, I, and I thank you for answering in that way because, because I have been told that I have to go to hell because of my position. And, and, I, and I'm very thankful that you, you were very, um, very diplomatic in the way you said that. So I, I, I applaud you. Thank you for that. So I, I just don't want that job. I'll leave that job to Christ. Are there any other questions? Okay, maybe you'll see the format. If you return tomorrow night, you'll have your questions ready. If you don't have pen and paper and you need them, we've got plenty of it up here. And you can do that uh, when you're here. Don't forget to come back tomorrow night at 7 p.m. The Lord willing, we'll continue this discussion with the same format as tonight, only it will be reversed. Uh, Derek will go first, uh, and then Brother Ron will go second, and that will be uh, the way we will conduct it tomorrow night. So have a safe trip home, and uh, tell everybody about the date if you'd like to come. And I believe it would be a good lesson for everybody in the world that would come. And so I hope to see you, plus bring a cup for Andrew and Bob, when yeah. I travel and teach, I always bring some free literature on different yeah, subjects. And that's here with the back. It's not for sale. Let them know they can pick up any of that. We have in the back on the table free literature on a lot of subjects two, three track racks back there, would give those to aid you in your study on subject matters in the Bible. Take all that you want that belongs to the Lord, and we bought it for that purpose, to distribute to you. And you can take those tracks and give those to a friend, lay it down on the workplace, in the table at the workplace, and somebody might pick it up and really track them a while. That's why it's called track. The track you know, where you go. But there's some good material back there. I don't know. So help yourself to all that's there. It's no charge. Free of cost. Okay. If that's it for this evening, thank you for your good presentation, both of them. Brother Charlie Ward is with us from over Winchester. And we'll ask him at this time to come and word a closing prayer, if you would. <clears throat> Let us bow. Loving Father in heaven, holy and reverent is your name. Mm -hmm. Father, we honor you. We praise you. For you are the creator of heaven and earth. Father, it is in you that we live and move and have our very being. It is from your bountiful hands that we receive every good and perfect gift. Father, we thank you for the scriptures that were presented in our hearing and our viewing this evening. We thank you, Father, for a better understanding of this subject of instrumental music and our worship. We pray, Father, that everything that was done here this evening was done with your approval mm -hmm. and we have manifested love one toward another. Yes. Father, let us search the scriptures for in them we have eternal life. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father, for your love your grace, and your mercy that you've extended to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, bless us as we go to our homes. Bless us for the safe journey home. Father, we'll give you the praise. We'll give you the glory. We'll give you the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>